chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 Children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on earth And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord No doubt, probably one of the most distressing things that can happen to a parent is the physical loss of a child. Some of you have experienced that. It's a very difficult and unpleasant experience. I wonder sometimes if we put that on the, le- on the level that it should be with regard to losing a child spiritually. In Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says that God was, it grieved God in his heart that he had made man. God was upset with the way that mankind was behaving. Sometimes we think God is angry, and the Bible says in Psalm 7 and verse 11 that God is angry with the wicked every day. But that doesn't mean he loses his concern and his love and his care. That it grieves God when His children are unfaithful. It hurts Him. It should hurt us. No doubt when a parent deals with that in their families, it is devastating when a parent is a faithful Christian and one of their children goes astray spiritually. It hurts very deeply. It raises deep concern. It causes us to to wonder, did we do something wrong, or what did we not do right? Brother Flavel Yakely has probably done more research on church history of our growth patterns than anyone that I know of, and he made some comp- some observations that our growth patterns in the Lord's church began to decline from 1965 through 75, and he made the warning that if that trend continued, the, the level of growth would be at zero by 1980. Well, the trend did continue, and in, by 1980, the growth of the Lord's body was indeed at zero. We didn't, we didn't seem to gain or lose. We just stayed at a certain number by the time 1980 rolled around. As a matter of fact, the church did only grew 1%, 1% from 1980 to 2003. And from 2003 to 2009, actually our numbers declined. Somebody raises the question, well, what has caused this decline? I'm going to be talking about our young people and our children this morning, and I don't believe for an instant that that is the only reason that the church has declined. But I do believe that it's a major reason. From the research that Brother Yakely did, we lose at least 50% across the board of our children to the world when they leave home. Now, it may not be true in one congregation. One congregation may only lose 25%. Another one may lose 75%. But on the average, we are losing 50% of our children to the world. So it raises a question in our minds. What will we do about this? What, what is indeed the problem what why is this happening well you and i know that in the world we live in today was different than my grandpa what he grew up in 
My granddaddy Leonard was born in 1892. My grandpa Austin was born in 1900. And they grew up in a time when the Bible was believed. It may not have been acted on as it should have been, but for the most part, our culture believed the Bible. For the most part, our culture believed in God. In our society today, it's not so true as it was then. We're living in an age what's called post-modernism. Modernism would question the Bible as to whether or not certain things may be inspired or not. Post-modernism says the Bible is not even true. It is the fruit of atheism. It is the fruit of unbelief. It is the fruit of a culture that has had said, has said no to God, no to the Bible, and no to Christianity. Well, naturally, our children are going to be affected by this kind of thinking. It's going to filter through certain areas, through their public schools, through magazines, through discussions with their peers, uh, through books that they may read, and through the movies they watch. And those things can be so subtle at times. But have you noticed that a lot of the TV shows, when, when we were younger, I can remember them talking about going to church on Leave it to Beaver. I can remember them talking about going to church on Andy Griffith. I can remember God being brought up in a lot of things. They don't talk about that on television anymore. Postmodernism has so many mediums. What is postmodernism? Well, the first thing is that it rejects the God of the Bible and replaces him with a man, a human being who is weak at best and is claimed to be the biggest and the best thing in the universe. That's humanism. That says that I'm more important than anything in the world as a human being. It also claims that there's no such thing as absolute truth, that truth is relevant, that, that you can't prove it, and certainly it dismisses the authority of Holy Scripture. These are the things that are coming at our children. And also, postmodernism asserts that there's really no such thing as a moral guide. There's nothing that tells us right from wrong. It's an individual's choice as to what he or she wants to do morally and ethically, and we're not obligated to, to keep anything except to be tolerant. And I think, well, if we're obligated to be tolerant, it sounds to me like somebody's intolerant with people who are going to be intolerant themselves. God is intolerant, but they've said no to God. The Bible is intolerant, but they've said no to the Bible. Therefore, postmodernism is having an effect on our children when they begin to believe these things. Not only does it do that, it believes that any and all points of view are equally valid, that your opinion is as good as mine, even though they may contradict. And of course, when you have no foundation, you have no solid rule or guide to go by, that's going to be the chaos that comes about. And it dismisses anyone who disagrees with it as being intolerant and judgmental and sometimes just flat out ignorant. That's how the world sees Christianity. And of course, we know that God is not tolerant when it comes to sin. And you take a stance with it, then you become accused of being intolerant. I'll tell you what. As long as I read the Bible and I see that I'm to bring my children up in the training and the admonition of the Lord, I'm going to do that. As long as there's breath in my body and my mental faculties are still working and I have any effect on my children, I'm going to do that. But you see what postmodernism has done, you know the fruit of it if you think about it. They have removed God from any and every public forum. And it's affecting our culture. I believe that's affecting some of our adult members. But whose mind is most impressionable? A young person. I stated in my Bible class this morning when I was brought up in the Lord's church, I didn't grow up in a non-Christian home. I never questioned the existence of God until I got in my 20s and started asking some questions about that. But as a child, I never questioned it. I never questioned the Bible. I never questioned whether or not that we should go to church, as we called it. That's what we did. Everybody's not being brought up that way. As a matter of fact, they're not many of our peers that our young people have, they don't go to worship anywhere. There are reasons for that. And the one number one reason for it is indifference. Even if they believe the Bible is from God, they have no concern for it. Are our children being affected by it? Indeed, they are. Someone had given the following quotes from people who claim to be Christians. And these are things that are also affecting our particular society. Christians who are to avoid being conformed to the world, Romans 12 and verse 2. But be transformed by the renewing of our minds. God's Word 
God's Word does the transforming. We choose to allow it to renew us and give us a certain mindset. But if you distance yourself from the Bible, if as an adult or a teenager, a young person, you're affected by the thinking of the world, you might believe as some do, I know the Bible says this, but... And then they'll go on with something that will contradict what the Bible actually says. There are those who are saying that the lesbians and the homosexuals have a right to choose any kind of lifestyle they want. These are Christians saying these things. Now I want you to think about it. If Christians are saying these things, and the young people are hearing these Christian adults say this kind of thing, then what do you expect the young people to believe? Did you believe your parents growing up on just about everything they said? Now, you know, there are certain times, maybe some parents that were very unbelievable, but for the most part, we believe what they said. And, and older brother, older sister, well, they're a little smarter. They're supposed to know a little more. And they say these things. So younger brother and younger sister, they listen to this, and they begin to believe it. And they bought into the idea that many have put out for years, well, that's just your interpretation. There are other interpretations that are also right. You can't have two interpretations and one of them contradict the other and both of them be right. That doesn't even make sense. Now, there may be some misunderstandings that people need to study, but these are some of the things people are saying. And some are saying, well, the Bible really needs to adapt to our culture instead of the other way around. Some are saying, well, I believe that baptism is for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins, and I believe that it's a burial or immersion in water. But those who baptize in a different way or for a different reason, they're also Christians. When we read the New Testament, we see a very clear explanation of what baptism is, how it is that Philip and the eunuch went down into the water in Acts chapter 8. He baptized him. What did he baptize him for? The remission of sins. That's according to Acts 2 and verse 38. My question is, has Acts 2 and verse 38 changed over time? Well, no, it hasn't. It's still there. It still teaches the same thing. But what happens, you begin then to broaden the, the idea of Christian fellowship that goes broader than what the Bible teaches. Many other things people are saying that, that, that are raising questions, that they say, well, they're even going to the point that, well, Jesus is the way to God for us, but other religions are also the way to God. Have you heard anyone say that? or at least have that particular idea in mind. Is it not true that throughout the Bible that the, sing, the one God of heaven is consistently there and all other gods are rejected? Isn't that the pattern in Scripture? Our culture has been inundated and in, infiltrated with some of the religions of the East. And at one time, uh, Buddha was in another country and I didn't know anything about him except he wasn't a very attractive thing to look at. I mean, just... I just thought, I just laughed at that. I don't laugh at it anymore because it's in our nation now. It's in our back doors now. I didn't know what a Muslim was when I was a child, but I do now. And I know that the God they serve is not the God of the Bible. And either one of two things is true, young people. I want you to listen to me as I speak to the youth too. Either the God of the Bible is the one and only true God, or all those others are equally valuable, and we might as well just let them come in here and do what they want to do too. We're going to have to draw a conclusion about this. I don't believe that, that Allah is God. When I was preaching for a congregation in Tennessee, there was a Christian lady who had been over in Arabia, I believe it was, serving in some kind of job that she had there. And something came up about Islam. And she says, well, they serve the same God that we do. And, and I was a little more timid back then, and I didn't say anything, but I sure did when I got in the car. I said, that's not so. And I know it's not so. Allah is not God. He's not even real. He's real to those people, but you can't have two or three gods. That's polytheism, isn't it? That's what Paul read into in Athens, Athens in Acts chapter 17. Which God did Paul point to in Acts 17? The one God of heaven and showed that he was a creator of all things, and ultimately converted some of those people to be Christians there. There are no people that belong to God outside the Christian faith. And yet, some of our young people are being told this. I want you to think this through. If they're being told these things, and they're believing them, what will their reaction be? Well, they're going to leave us, more than likely. And if they stay here, they're not going to be happy. 
because because as far as I'm concerned, as long as I'm the preacher here, we're not going to be tolerant of other religions. Let me say this. That has nothing to do with our love and concern for other people. Not one thing to do with it. But either God is God. Either Jesus is the only Savior, which Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If there's no other God, no other Savior, and no other book, then we will be intolerant on that point. We won't be ugly about it. We certainly should not be unkind about it. But neither should we be ashamed of it, or run from it, or be tolerant of anything that's contrary to it. We must be strong for our young people. That doesn't mean we don't love other people. It has nothing to do with that. So then we, we come to the idea of, of where, where then does it start? It starts, you're going, some of us are not going to like this, but it does not start in our Sunday school program. That's part of it. It doesn't necessarily start in our pulpits. That's part of it. It doesn't necessarily start in our Bible classes. That's part of it. It starts at home. Because, not because the preaching of the gospel is not valid. Not because Bible classes are unnecessary. But because what our children cling to and believe and live by is what they get at home. They get from their mother, from their father. And I want to say this about it, we must instill in the minds of our children the great fundamental truths of God's Word. We must do it. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But some parents have been influenced themselves by this culture. And they've bought into some of these things. And if they buy into these things, then what then will be passed on to their children? Naturally, the things that they believe. I believe another reason we're having a problem has been indistinct preaching in some of our pulpits. There has been lack, a lack of a clear explanation of the true church of the New Testament. There's been a lack of clear explanation of how the Bible teaches that one must be saved. There's been a lack of very clear teaching on how we are to worship the God of heaven according to the New Testament. There's been a very unclear and been, and been a lack of teaching with regard to the roles of men and women and with regard to the, the authority of Scripture. We need those things. And naturally, the pulpit must be strong, and we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But I want to say another reason might be a lack of evangelistic zeal on the part of church members. We need to care about lost people, but we don't need to just talk about it. We need to find ways and means to reach and to teach. If my children don't see me exercising that in my life, what do you think they're going to do? How do you think they're going to, to conduct themselves in that particular area? If they don't see the church of our Lord excited about reaching out with the gospel, then, <clears throat> then what do we expect the children to do? Do they not imitate us more than we realize? We know they do. We realize they do. What I need to think about is they will do it and what am I doing that I don't want them to do or what am I not doing that they need to be doing. So at one time, we were the fastest growing religious group in this nation. I know there are a lot of factors that have played into this. But I want you to think about it as we go through the lesson today. This is not necessarily singling out the children, but that is the purpose of the lesson this morning. Uh, because... In the day, early days when we were evangelistic as a church, we went because we had a message that every person needed and desperately needed. Now it seems that we assemble at our buildings, speak to one another, hug, and go home. It's got to be more than that. And that's one of the reasons this meeting today for visitation is so important. And please be praying about the gospel meeting that's coming up in May. I don't know if I told you this, but we have the preacher lined up, and we have Bob and Betty Gray coming the week before. Brother Bob's going to teach and preach on that Sunday. And they're, Now, these are elderly saints. 
They're not, they're not young people. They're going to park their camper out here, and we need to be here ready and willing to help them in what these elderly saints are going to do for this congregation in this area to try and get out and let people know we're here and what we have to share. But if there's no such thing as absolute truth, and we really don't think people are lost, maybe you and I have been influenced, and maybe subtly. Maybe we hadn't thought about it that way. Do you really believe that people outside of Christ are lost? If we believe that, then we'll act on it. But then it raised the question, well, what shall we do? Do we just fold our hands and say, well, preacher, you spelled it out. I guess we need to go home and work on this. Or I would say, no, I need to talk about this a little bit further. Parents, we must assume the God-given role that Almighty God has given to us. I cannot, I don't know, I, I trust Steve Jones, but I don't know what he's saying back there in that classroom. And I'm not saying I have a problem with it. I'm just using it as an example. But I do trust him. But I know this, that's not, those are not his children. Those are my children. And I'm responsible for those children. I'm responsible for them more than they know. Sometimes I'm more responsible for them than I think about. It's a weighty responsibility. In Psalm 127, in verse 3, the psalmist says, Children are a heritage of the Lord. One particular individual said the Hebrew word there that's translated heritage means a possession granted by God as a gift from Him. And I think about that and I think these are gifts from God. God gave these children to me. And somebody made the observation with these gifts, these particular gifts comes great responsibility. And indeed there does. Under the law of Moses, you no doubt have read Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this was the, the giving of the law the second time. Deuteronomy, mean, Deuteronomy meaning second law. The children of Israel were set, getting ready to go settle in the land of Canaan. They were not quite there yet. And God has given them instruction through their servant Moses. And it's interesting how he addresses, he addresses, as I read this, ultimately it comes down to the parents. In verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be in your ears. You shall teach them diligently to one another. No, no, no. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house. I ask you a question. Who is Moses talking to? He's talking to parents. Could it be include grandpa and grandma? Sure. Could it be Uncle Jose or whatever Hebrew name he would have? Sure it did. But doesn't it first begin with dad and mom to be responsible? Teach them diligently to your children. Talk about them when you're in your house. And when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And then, of course, you shall bind them as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The idea here with regard to teaching diligently comes uh, in a figurative way. It means to sharpen, as to sharpen a sword, to put an edge on it. The idea is that just as words are cut into a stone tablet with a sharp object, object so the law of God should be impressed on the hearts of children for every generation. I raise the question, how are we doing with that? I raise this question, Mom. I raise this question, Dad, starting in the pulpit. Are we giving our children the guidance and the teaching that they need? I ask this question. Was it important for the children of Israel to know the law of God before they went and settled in the land of Canaan? And if it was so, why was it so? Because when they went in the midst of those ungodly people who they were supposed to have driven out, but they did not, they would draw them away from God. You take and cut the Word of God deeply into the heart of a child. They know that Word. They know who God is. They know what God expects. 
They know the blessings of God. They know the warnings of God. They know everything that God expects with regard to worship. He is the only God. All these other gods are false. They settled in the land of Canaan. Those families would survive spiritually. But those who failed to do that would die by the sword of their enemies. Not only that, they would lose their souls. So we move then to the New Testament. It was read to us in just a moment ago, Ephesians 6 and verse 4. It's still true. So, so often we're talking about the mamas sitting on the, the children sitting on mama's knee. And I know more often than not that that's where a child is found. I mean, that's just nature's way. That God is it's just natural when I say nature. It's just natural that it's that way. God made a woman that way. But God was not talking to women in Ephesians 6 and verse 4. He was not talking to mothers. He was talking to Roger L. Leonard. He was talking to every man who has a child in his home. I want you to bring those children up. The word means to nourish in chapter 5 and verse 29. It has a broader meaning of training a child in general with two terms that fall regarding the more specific acts of education. Training, which means discipline, and it, apply, and it has to do with providing guidance for responsible living. So I read that and I see that particular text and I say, Roger, that means more than making sure your child goes to Sunday school. That means more than making sure that you have them there on Wednesday nights. That means you take the time, your time in your house, or if you're riding down the road, or if you're just walking down, down around the neighborhood, as we sometimes do, wherever we go, I want you to know me, God says. I want you to know my son, God says. I want you to know my word. I want you to know about my church. I want you to know how you're supposed to live, how to become a Christian, how to live as a Christian. How to get to heaven. How to help other people get to heaven. I want you to know Christianity inside out, top side and bottom. Now precious people, if our children learn that, there's a, there's a real good chance we won't lose them. But if they don't, there's a 50% chance. There may be a 100% chance if you take it down to individuals that we'll lose them. I look at that and I'm, I'm thinking of the whole training of a child to, to admonish. And it implies that there is some difficulty or problem that has to be addressed. Our culture is suffering from a lack of understanding for the need of discipline. When a child steps in front of you, you're walking through a store and they act like you're not even there, somebody fail that child. They don't respect other people. All they care about themselves is what they're going to look at on the shelf. Now, I'll give any child a little wiggle room for just not paying attention because when I was a child, I didn't. But if I saw my child do that, it's a whole different story. We need to teach them in every area of life that other people matter and the way they live matters. That we provide the training necessary so they can be productive and respected citizens of society, and valuable, productive members of the church. And I'm thinking of that and how important it is that the behavior then, the training, is so much broader than we sometimes see it. And parents, dads, moms, we have to accept this as God's truth. And I, I just have a feeling, if I did a survey, there's not a parent in this room that would say this didn't come from God. I believe every one of you believes that. But how are we doing it implementing it? How are we doing it planting the seeds of truth in the hearts of our children? When Clay was about 18, I put in his hands a, a debate by Guy in Woods and Given O. Blakely on instrumental music in the worship of the church. I said, I want you to read that debate. And then I want you to come back and tell me what it said. And, and, and we know that, that we, we, we played music last night, but that wasn't to the glory of God. That was just secular enjoyment. We don't see any use of instrumental music in the worship of the church in the New Testament. It doesn't mean we don't like them. It doesn't mean we can't afford them. It means that God has spoken that we are to sing in Ephesians 
519, Colossians 3.16, we sing and we speak to one another as psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And that's the pattern of worship in the New Testament church. But I'm saying that I gave Clay that book. I said, I want you to study that book. I want you to read it. And you come back and you tell me what you think about it. And he read it and he says, Brother Woods just won that hands down. I said, are you sure? He said, no question about it. I said, now I want to ask you a question. Are you convinced of the position that he took because I asked you to read the book? No, sir. I said, are you convinced of that he won the debate because he made a good argument? He said, no, sir. I said, what are you convinced of? He says, the Bible tells us how to worship and Brother Woods proved it. But my point is, if you want your children to know, you've got to teach them. You've got to show them. It doesn't, and we don't do it with any unkindness. Second thing we could ask, other than parents, is what can the church do? Well, preachers need to be clear that we preach the whole counsel of God. As Paul said that he did in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. There should be no stone unturned when it comes to preaching truth. We need to cover every area. There are some things that are a little more pleasant than others, but we have to teach them. Bible school teachers, make sure you're being thorough in your teaching with the children. Because you may be, in some cases, the only godly influence they're getting. We know we're bringing some children in here that, that, are, that need this. Desperately need it. And you're feeding them something that nobody else may be feeding them. And we don't want to play that down. The value of it is very, very, very important. But we raise the question, what then can we do? Well, I want to do something for the young people. And I'm going to ask, ask Will to come up here and read this from Ecclesiastes in verses 9 through 10. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart, and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Thank you, Will. You see, this particular text, we shift this from parents to preachers, to grandparents, from, from these people, to young people. Young people, listen to God. If you can hear me, and you can understand me, I want you to listen to me. And if you're asleep, wake up. I want you to listen to me. God says, rejoice in your youth. Enjoy being a child. God wants you to do that. Rejoice in it. And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. In other words, youth is so wonderful, isn't it? So many things to discover and to enjoy and come and tell somebody, guess what I saw? And, and you're sitting there as a parent, well, I've seen those a hundred times, but that child just saw it for the first time and they're excited about it. I need to be excited about it. But God says enjoy that. <clears throat> but, and walk in the ways of your heart. But he gives a warning, <clears throat> but know this, that for all these God will bring you into judgment. One day as a young person, you're going to reach a certain age in your life and you're going to make some very serious decisions. Some of you are not ready, but sometime it's going to come to you to, to become a Christian. You're going to read the Bible. And you're going to see that the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God in Romans 10, 17. And that's the only place you're going to get it. It also teaches us to repent of our sins. And that we read in Acts 2 and verse 38 to repent. Jesus preached it in Luke 13, 3 and verse 5. Peter preaches it in Acts 2, 38. Again, chapter 3 and verse 19. Jesus wants His name confessed before men. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. You deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. 
And then the Bible teaches us to be baptized. What is the purpose of baptism, young people? Well, the Bible teaches in Acts 2 and verse 38 that it's for the remission of sins. That's when your sins are washed away. But you have to be convinced that you're guilty. And so you do that, you're baptized for the remission of sins, and you become a member of the church, as we read in Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. But then there's that Christian life. You see, when you make that decision, you begin to live for Jesus. You begin to live for God. You begin to serve your fellow man in the church and out of the church. And you're going to answer for your shenanigans. And you say, What's that? what does that mean? Well, oh, that's when you do foolish things. That's when you do things that <clears throat> you're glad mama didn't know you did it. You're glad daddy didn't catch that one. You're going to do that when nobody's looking but your friends. There are certain things that may not be so bad, but there's some things that are, and when you get to be old enough to be accountable, you're going to answer for those things. And God says you will. So it's very serious that we turn from our responsibility as parents, as teachers and preachers, and say, young people, you have a responsibility to do what God wants you to do. And you know what? Nobody can answer for you but you. There's a time when nobody will answer to God for you but you. Make sure it's a good answer. Don't listen to people who aren't listening to God. <clears throat> Young people, don't listen to people who make fun of the Bible. Young people, don't listen to people who make fun of church and churchy things because Jesus gave His life for the church. Can you imagine Him allowing someone to make fun of what He gave His life for on the cross of Calvary? You see, people don't know, young people, what they're making fun of. They don't have a clue. Because many of them have not been taught the things that you have. They don't know any better. You be loving and say, you know, that's just not right. There is a God. And the Bible is His Word. And I believe that with all my heart. But don't be ugly to them. Because you might be a part of their soul salvation in the way that you respond. And all of us as adults. Thinking on these things, let us do our best as we bring this lesson to a conclusion to not lose a single child of the devil in this assembly today. Not a one. Now you have your obligation in that area. I have mine. And let us as parents and adults take responsibility for these gifts that God has given to us. I've said this before and I'll say it again. He gave them to me and He wants them back. Every one of them. What an awesome responsibility that we have. Thinking about that, you may be in the audience today and something has been said to cause you to think about your soul. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel. you never become a Christian as the Bible teaches it. And you say, I'd like to study that a little more. Well, let me know. I'd be glad to discuss that with you. Somebody else may say, I'm ready. I want to be a Christian today. It could be that you're a Christian. You've fallen by the wayside. You have been unfaithful to God. You've not served Him as you should. You've not lived for Him as you should. And you need to be restored to your first love so that heaven can be a promise for you when this life is over. Jesus extends the invitation through this song and at this time as we stand and sing.